a government cannot just close its eyes to what is going on in front of everybody else's eyes. Let's be honest, there are going to be people in the Conservative Party probably hoping that they had seen the back of David Cameron in 2016. Um, and, oh my goodness, he's back again. I mean, I think we were all slightly aghast. In certain constituencies where uh, there are strong um, uh, Muslim sections of the population, uh, they have been unsatisfied with Labour's position. Hello and welcome to The Political Forecast. This week, how is the war in Gaza affecting British politics? The Foreign Secretary, David Cameron, has been to America, but he's under pressure to publish his legal advice here on arms sales to Israel. Labour says the advice should be public, which is something of a cheek from the party that refused to publish its legal advice for war in Iraq. But it's also the party losing the most support over Gaza. Keir Starmer's support for what he said was Israel's right to defend itself was controversial from the start. He's already lost one election to George Galloway over Gaza. Could there be more in the offing? With Gary and me today, two people from the House of Lords with impeccable credentials for all of this. Charlie Faulkner was at the heart of Tony Blair's government during the Iraq war and served every leader since. And the Tory peer, Nicky Morgan, who joined David Cameron's government just before the last Israel-Gaza war in 2014, and is a close ally of the man who is now foreign secretary. We'll also get to that dinner date David Cameron had with Donald Trump this week. But first, let's, let's talk about Gaza. I mean, Gary, the, the assumption normally is that this sort of thing doesn't infect the British political sort of rough and tumble debate. But something has happened over the last couple of weeks, and it's probably the attack on the convoy, which, 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 which led to three British aid workers being killed, um, that has turned this into a British political story as well. Yes, it's put it absolutely on the front pages. And uh, because President Biden uh, seems to have shifted his uh, position a bit uh, at the moment as well, that's put the whole thing centre stage. What's happening is that uh, though the Britain and America uh, are trying to work out how to head off a replication of what's happened in all the other Israeli incursions into Gaza when it comes to Rafa. And there are perhaps a few weeks uh, to spare in order to try and put in arrangements for what looks like an inevitable Israeli incursion into Rafa, and they want to put in better arrangements than they've uh, had for humanitarian relief in all those other incursions. And so I think a lot of the attention uh, and the fact that you've got new language from President Biden uh, isn't just because uh, of the hit on the humanitarian uh, workers, but also because of this timing, this acute timing in the Israeli operation. But the, the, the way it's also sort of playing out in British politics is over the question of British arms sales to Israel. Now, British arms sales to Israel are pretty minuscule, but they are symbolically important to, to lots of people. And David Cameron, um, who, who did, as Prime Minister, have a situation back in 2014 when arms sales were going to be suspended, uh, had the Israeli... Um, war gone on then is now in this position where he won't say what the legal advice is, uh, uh, but he says that, you know, nothing's changed to actually stop uh, arms sales going ahead. So what he actually said was uh, he'd seen the latest legal opinion. I understand that legal opinion was actually drafted possibly as long ago as December, but not much after January. And uh, although these things are kept under review, uh, there isn't a brand new one. So you might have thought, listening to David Cameron speak in, in Washington this week, that when he said the latest, uh, he was he got a red hot uh, piece of legal opinion in his pocket. Um, he hasn't, uh, but he, he doesn't look like a man who's about to demand that they write it. I mean, that's really significant, isn't it? I mean, they don't really want to know the truth. It doesn't look like they're in a huge hurry to get out of kilter with uh, America. There is a, a joint approach at the moment, which... Uh, Britain feels more comfortable, the British government feels more comfortable with, uh, and uh, and they feel that America has uh, moved a bit. They, they, they don't want to rock the boat. I mean, the, the talking as a former law officer, uh, I don't know when the timing of David Cameron's last advice was, but it plainly gives him a very significant amount of wriggle room as to whether or not there is a breach of international humanitarian law 
if we as a government or they as a government conclude that there is a breach of international humanitarian law, then in effect the foreign secretary is obliged to advise the business department mm -hmm. that the licenses mm -hmm. to sell the £42 million pounds worth of, of, of arms has, has, has got to be, they've got to be revoked. Because as you said a few moments ago, a government cannot just close its eyes to what is going on in front of everybody else's eyes. There will need to be a proper consideration. Cameron has been very skillful in his appearances in select committees here and in the interviews he gave with Blinken yesterday to say, I am not in a position where I've got to stop arms sales, mm. which is almost certainly true. Mm. But how long can that continue? I just don't know. But do, do you understand why he, he doesn't want to say now what the government was prepared to say in 2014 and what British governments have said before I, I, in the I mean, past. I think, I, think, I, I, mean I, I don't know the precise details of the 2014 position. It is a fast-moving and evolving situation. So you, the lawyers have got to be quite careful. I don't know whether there is material that the IDF are saying to America and the UK about things that we don't know which justifies it. One's got to be quite careful not simply to rely on news reports. However, the, the, the evidence is building up that there should be a formal assessment. And I, I, I can completely see why no politician wants to be hemmed in by legal advice, they want they want freedom of manoeuvre because there are there's there's big international issues. What is best for Britain, but there are also domestic political issues as well. So being hemmed in is a problem for the government. They don't want to be hemmed in. But if we subscribe to international law, which is a sort of unique selling point of the United Kingdom government, then a point will be reached where we cannot avoid getting a formal assessment made. I'm not giving a definitive legal view, but there must come a point fairly soon when 33,000 deaths, seven aid workers, the extent to which there are very big question marks about the extent to which measures have been taken to reduce civilian casualties, which is what the, what the, what the Israeli government say. I mean, you have to test that against some but legal yardstick. That's the, the point, isn't it? It's not just about, it's about legal advice, but of course it's not an isolation. It's about the politics, both globally, um, about the UK's relationship with other countries, as you say, the conversations that will have happened in Washington this week and are ongoing. But of course, it's also about the politics back here at home as well and the sort of public opinion, which I think um, has has shifted um, in light of the deaths of the aid workers. Public opinion was very different probably in October after the horrendous events of October the 7th. And I think people absolutely understood, many people, why Israel was taking the action that it was. And of course, although David Cameron is not an M MP, he's not going to stand on a doorstep asking for himself to be re-elected, he has to operate in a political environment, as do all members of the, the cabinet. So it's not like other walks of life where um, the lawyers, and both Charlie and I are um, uh, plead guilty to being, to being lawyers or haven't been lawyers in the, in the past. Uh, it's not, the legal advice is, is very important, but of course there's a broader political but, I mean, issue I, as well. I, I'm not saying ultimately that the politics would justify ignoring breaches of international... No, 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 of course not. Uh, but but it might speed up. The politics might speed up. So it's possible yeah, that the uh, you might get to some change in policy first because yeah. the politics are sped up, if I could put it that way, um, or the international sort of feeling about what's happened, even before the lawyers get there. And in some ways, that could be easier for the politicians rather than having the Attorney General suddenly sort of saying, this is now my view, or the Business Department saying, you know what, we need to go and check our legal advice again before we grant the next round of, of licences. Yeah. This, this government will be desperate to be in lockstep with America, Absolutely. who are the big supplier and won't yeah. want to be uh, looking like they're sending a, a, a moral ticking off to America. Uh, so even if you know, some, there were some lawyers lurking in the Foreign Office. Uh, this may bring back some distant echoes, uh, Charlie. It uh, does. Who, who, who are feeling very unsettled by what's going on. They might choose not to listen too hard or ask for their opinions. Well, that's such an interesting, that's so insightful a remark because I, I'm sure that the, that the Foreign Office would not wish to be out of lockstep with uh, the American government. Who are, who are getting louder and louder in their sending of signals to mm -hmm. Israel that we want to change in policy. But 
I, I, I don't want to sound like a sort of completely ivory towered lawyer. The test of whether or not international humanitarian law is being broken is a legal test rather than one that involves can we do what America wants? That's not enough, obviously. Will Britain reach a stage where its legal opinion is out of step with America's? It's difficult to know if that would happen, but public opinion may be quite an important factor, as Nikki says, mm -hmm. in determining whether or not, for example, the Prime Minister can avoid, when asked the question, well, why are you not getting proper, which is Krishna's <coughs> an, an initial question, why are you not, why can't you tell us, don't yeah. tell us necessarily what the detail of it is, but tell us, have you got legal advice that says definitively you can go on supplying arms because there is not a breach of international law? And, and one of the legal requirements you, one hears that the Foreign Office lawyers are uh, particularly uh, concerned about is an occupying power has a responsibility to look after uh, the people uh, in the territory it's occupying. Yeah. And on those grounds in particular, uh, you hear some of the lawyers are, are most nervous. Exactly. I mean, British gov I mean, you're so interesting what you say about the America-UK relationship. You remember, you probably do remember, Gary, when um, Anthony Eden uh, embarked on war Vividly. in Egypt in 1956. <laughs> you, you really remember it. And we were very, very out of step with America when we did it and were basically brought mm. to heel mm. by America saying, we'll not support you in the foreign exchange markets unless you mm. stop your incursion. So that this is the key, isn't it? It's that we, we don't want to say something that embarrasses the Americans, either well, on weapons well, sales or on genocide, because if you trigger not, the genocide word It's well, not just that, because the Conservative Party is in a different place on things like this anyway from yeah. uh, quite a large chunk of the Labour Party. It's more of an internal issue for the Labour Party uh, than it is for the Conservative Party. Right? But there's a, there's a, the, the, there are domestic political concerns. How does it affect, yep. for example, Labour support in Muslim communities? How does it affect support for Labour amongst Jewish communities who have seen Labour as being anti-Semitic in the past? So there, there, are, there are those domestic concerns, but they are probably in terms of how the government is operating or how Labour is operating, much less important, probably, than the much bigger picture. I mean, it's very rare that a big international event or war becomes yeah. an election issue here, but is this one that could become? Well, I think we're, I'm, I'm know, conscious of In certain of that. seats, at least. No, no. Well, look, you're, Charlie will know better. I'm conscious of the fact that you've got two people who are not going to be standing for election uh, this year. Stand, uh, uh, but I mean, Four, I think. Well, <laughs> to, to the, those yeah. who are politicians, I suppose, yeah. who are not standing for, for election. But, but um, so it, I'm sure it, it is absolutely going to be an issue amongst some communities in some constituencies. And I was trying to think beforehand. The, the last time I think was probably Iraq where actually for the 2005 general election, where I was first a candidate in Loughborough, I could tell that there were people who would normally have voted Labour who were voting, either not voting Labour or voting Liberal Democrat instead. And people were quite open in saying that to me about how that, that had shifted their vote. I think that will probably be the last, the last time. Um, but it does take a particular, and I just don't know whether, of course, we don't know, we're what, six months out from an expected general election here. You know, what the situation will be, how it will affect. I mean, I broadly agree with what Nikki is saying. I think it will definitely have an impact on support for Labour in certain specified constituencies, probably too few constituencies to make a difference to the overall result yeah. of a general election. But I think in certain constituencies where uh, there are strong... Um, uh, Muslim sections of the population, uh, they have been unsatisfied with Labour's position. In places where there are significant Muslim communities, we are vulnerable because it is thought that we have not, as it were, kept a middle path in relation to it. It will have some effect in the election. I'm not sure it is like the Iraq experience. In Iraq, it was us the United Kingdom government True. making a decision about whether to participate in an armed incursion into Iraq. And it was vigorously opposed by progressive opinion in this country. The million people marching, I suspect, is a different phenomenon mm. for the, from the regular mm. um, um, uh, demonstrations made in support of Gaza against what the IDF are doing. There was a real, real sense of opposition, middle class opposition particularly, to what had happened. As you know, there was then an election in 2000, 
and five, which we which we Labour still won, because even even a decision that is our the UK's decision, which is a foreign policy decision, doesn't affect things yeah. obviously as much as domestic. So, so it's not, and this is not the 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 Gaza issue is not ultimately what the UK government is doing. It's how it's reacting yeah. to other people's okay. decisions. Keir Starmer's problems here are not so much uh, on the doorstep as round the shadow cabinet table and on the green benches. And or, or at least that's that's where they become uh, most acute. And it was only uh, just just over a, a month ago that we, House Commons was voting on the uh, SNP motion on Gaza. Uh, the Speaker came to an arrangement yep. with Keir Starmer that day, he faced a potential rebellion by some very well-informed people, say, maybe 100 Labour MPs. And as is an opposition leader about to come into power, that is a massive dent to your authority. That would have been so bruising. Uh, he could have faced very significant uh, uh, front bench resignations. And... That tells you, A, just the potential of this issue, but also the sort of stuff that Keir Starmer might have to deal with in power. Um, these issues like this can bubble up in the Labour Party, particularly if it's a Labour Party in government, more easily than they can in the Conservative mm. Party and cause you an awful lot of trouble. But go back to Iraq. We faced a very big rebellion in the Commons in relation to Iraq, which ultimately was not threatening to the government only... Mm because the Conservative Party supported it. So, so in a sense, uh, these sorts of fractures about foreign policy tend to be more damaging to a Conservative government than to a Labour government, because you'll find the Conservatives tend to be more supportive of a government taking the sort of hard line, which then leads to problems within the Labour Party. But what do you think the mindset was? I mean, do, I mean, do, do you think basically the hangover of Jeremy Corbyn's leadership meant that Keir Starmer ended up being more pro-Israel than he would ordinarily have been. I think it is a combination of the hangover of, we were found guilty of anti-Semitism by the Equalities Commission. So it's not a question of opinion, as it were mm. a definitive body okay. found us guilty. We have at all times to be clear that we will not be like that. So, so, uh, and... So he was, was limited in what he could do. It, well, he wasn't limited in what he could do, but 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 that is a that is inevitably a factor in his thinking. I think the sorts of um, uh, pressures you face as leader of the opposition are inevitably different from what you've got to face as the prime minister. And the prime minister, in making judgments about how to deal with the Gaza thing, will will have the benefit of the a huge machine giving him advice. He can to a significant extent, set his own timescale for giving reasoned judgments about what he does. As a leader of the opposition, you've got to mm. respond almost immediately to things. The setting of government will suit Keir well, I think, almost better than being leader of the opposition. I mean, um, th this prime minister's reaction is also worth talking about, though, isn't it? Because yeah. a prime minister embattled on the domestic front is offered an opportunity to go and stride the world stage and grip an international crisis. And he gave it away. Well, he's appointed, obviously, somebody as foreign secretary who, um, well, I don't think they hadn't worked together, but I mean, um, I, mean I, I actually think it was uh, the right thing to do because I think uh, the Rishi Sunak knew that the domestic agenda is going to be so full that he's got to fight a general election. I think it's fascinating because so often what we see in prime ministers, as you say, when it becomes difficult at home, they turn to, I'm going to be on the world stage, I'm going to do this, I'm going to get this attention, which I don't think, I think is of interest to the British public, but I don't think it's definitive in terms of who wins or who loses a general election. So what is unique about Rishi Sunak, and obviously we'll see how it plays out, is the fact he has decided, I'm not going to do that world leader thing. I am going to focus on domestics. And I'm going to appoint somebody who I trust, who has um, enough of a, a reputation that when David Cameron you know, wants to, to see people, he's able to, to, to go around the world. Um, and you know, he, he, they know they can work together and that uh, actually their politics and their views are going to be pretty well aligned. Um, it's very different from what other prime ministers have, have done. That, that's absolutely he's true. He's kind of franchised it out a bit, it, hasn't I he? He's, he's staying indoors with his spreadsheets. And, and you know, can, yeah, it, 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 I think it, 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 it helps the conduct of our foreign policy that you have this very big figure, uh, David Cameron, 
who, if our foreign policy goes well, he will get the credit in a way that Rishi Sunak will not. He's got Andrew Mitchell, who is a, a, a very experienced yep. development person, to have the two of them running our foreign policy, because they're both broadly very experienced. Yep. Both you think keep them on? Well, <laughs> necessarily there has been recommendations suggesting that he could, yeah. Them, but if they, <laughs> if they leave their CVs with us, we'll have a look and see. But the, but the, the idea that these two, I mean, I think Nikki's language is rather accurate, which is, sorry, Rishi's saying I'm too busy, I've got to leave, leave foreign policy to these other two gentlemen, um, means that the government won't get much credit for success in foreign policy. And I think Nikki's also right when she says, you know, the temptation would be to seek success abroad, but that's not an option really that's open to Rishi at the moment. But also, I think governments don't get a huge amount of, of credit or otherwise in terms of... We talked about Iraq in terms of elections, but actually, um, I suppose in doorstep conversations, people kind of take it for granted that the government wants to keep them safe. Mm. Um, but they don't often... I don't, rem I don't remember many really detailed conversations about about foreign policy or about this. I'm a, I mean, look, elections come down to uh, who's going to look after me and my family, who's going to make my, my financial situation better, my child's school better, my health system that I access better. And that is in my experience. And I think that is why, but I mean, Gary's right about, you know, Rishi Sunak is, and one of the criticisms is that he is a person that likes, he likes detail, he likes getting into it. He's sort of likes to un, undo a knotty problem. Um, and that takes time in Downing Street and that's causing frustration because people are saying, well, I can't get any decisions out. Um, and he probably, he hasn't had the time because of everything he's had to cope with to become a sort of prime minister who's done a lot on domestically and then can go and stride the world but stage. What, what, are, what are people saying in West, I mean, is this causing ructions in Westminster, that, that David Cameron's coming back and getting all this praise? I, I don't there's sort of necessarily ructions, but I mean, I think it would be fair to say, um, and I'm a huge fan of, of David Cameron's, I loved working for him, um, I'm delighted that he's now in the House of Lords, um, but let's be honest, there are going to be people in the Conservative Party who are not going to join me in those feelings. Um, and they were probably hoping that they had seen the back of David Cameron in 2016. Um, and oh my goodness, he's back again. I mean, I think we were all slightly aghast, weren't we? And the, that, that news broke at nine o'clock on that Monday morning. What do you mean David Cameron's wandered into Downing Street? I don't know where you were, Gary, but I mean, I think the rest of us like, has he, did he know it was reshuffled there? Has he blundered? Oh no, he's <laughs> yeah. meant to be there because he's going to be foreign secretary. Well, jolly good. I was delighted. But, but look, there are going to be people in the Conservative Party uh, who are not. And of course, don't, the other thing is, um, 2019 intake, David Cameron has not worked with many of them. They don't mm. know him. And so I think the you know, advice for a number of us was that the, he's going to find the party very different, the Conservative Parliamentary Party now, than the one he left in, in 2016. He's, he's also getting, he's, David Cameron personally, who is a very impressive figure, and uh, I mean, this is a, a sort of, if you see him in the Lords, he is a, he's absolutely a commanding yeah. figure. Um, after he ceased to be Prime Minister after the Brexit result, I mean, he's, he's, I mean, his 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 post um, prime ministership period has become slightly defining for him, and has not been a thoroughgoing success in a number. He was in the hut for most of it. Wasn't oh, he? I don't know if he was in yeah. the hut, but when he was out of the hut, things didn't go that well for him. So he he has got a personal motivation, which I don't blame him for. You're saying he's reputation laundering. Well, he's using well, the House yes, of Lords. Well, not not using the House of Lords, but being the Foreign Secretary, <laughs> and people will remember. Um, Cameron is the foreign secretary rather than all the things that went on inside and outside the hut during oh, that I think, period. Well, okay, I, I take no sense why you're saying that, Charlie, but I think that's a slightly ungenerous characterization. Okay, I mean, I think look, at the end of the day, like life after being frontline politics is not easy for, for, for lots of people. Um, and we don't know what to do with ex-politicians actually no, in agree. this country. We're not great. We're not the US where we, we celebrate people who've been at the forefront of public life and say, you know, please come back and everything else. And the fact is, um, I think we, we do need, we want good people who have got world leading reputations in the House of Lords and yeah, to be that, our foreign I'm, secretary. I'm welcoming so that. I think, yeah, I think we should we should recognise we have got somebody who and and you know, as you said, Gary, the world is not it's not a stable place. It's not a, it's not the safe place it has been. But, but we when are you say in a world different leading world. reputation, I mean there are a lot of people going to be listening to that going, what? I mean <laughs> this is the man who called a, re a referendum thinking he was going to win it and then ended up with Brexit. Resigned, yeah, I was there. Don't worry, it's pretty painful. Was then yeah. engulfed in scandal and is now sort of. I mean, yeah, a lot of people but think he's he sort of. But, but, there's one person doing very well out of David Cameron's foreign secretary term, and it's David Cameron because his reputation is being 
But rescue. the fact the fact is that he um, has been a prime minister. Um, he is able to talk to uh, other world leaders. He's used to operating on the but world stage. But is he stage. that good? I mean, if you even if you look this week, I mean, Charlie, you say he's very impressive, and, and I always wonder, you know, are we sort of hoodwinked by a guy who can speak well um, and and is a commanding figure rather than look at the substance? I mean, this week he he did this amazing sort of social media video coming out of the the NATO conference, talking about Britain's foreign policy position. Mm. You and I, mean, I couldn't really do it. It was, it was, it was two it was and a half minutes. Two and a half minutes. Remembered script. Yeah. Yeah. One, one shot piece to camera, walking out of a conference, you know, from the room, from the hall, out into the outside. And it was great to watch. And lots of people were going, my goodness, you know, I'd forgotten what great communication is. But the, the, the point about that piece to camera was that at the end, he then grandstanded about what he wanted from Speaker Johnson in America. Yeah. And that was the Ukraine funding. And he said, and that's why I'm going to go and tell Speaker Johnson that that's why, you know, he's got to get this vote on the floor of the House. And what happens? He goes to America. Speaker Johnson's people probably look at that video and go, well, sod you, you're not getting a meeting. Yeah. I mean, and he's been snubbed. That's not great diplomacy, is it? But I mean, the, the, <laughs> well, the, question, the questions that you're raising, I think David Cameron is, a, is probably a very, very, very good day-to-day Foreign Secretary. The questions you raised just then are about the extent to which his bigger strategic judgment is right or wrong. So Brexit and the things that happened after he was uh, Prime Minister. What's happening at the moment to Britain is we've got to make decisions and react quite fast to a whole series of things that are going on in the outside world. Ukraine, uh, Gaza is the two obvious examples at the moment. So what we're looking for is a is a convincing, uh, well connected diplomat in chief, and he's very good at that. But there are bigger questions about his judgment, I suspect. It was interesting at that press conference yesterday. You see him next to Tony Blinken, who's uh, a, a sort of low, a sotto voce, uh, understated diplomatic uh, approach, and David Cameron's doing this prime ministerial speech talking about mm. the beaches in Normandy <laughs> and, 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 yeah. and as if he was addressing the whole nation, not a room of some Do you journalists. think that he should be like Alec Douglas Hume, who was the prime minister for 12 months, then became the, didn't he become the foreign secretary Un under, under Heath yes. for approximately a year? You keep asking me to delve into black well, and white. When you were there. Uh, uh, I, I, I tell you, I tell you. The Gary was there. Yeah, Gary, you've been covering politics so well. Gary is the institutional memory of British politics. Ken Clark. Uh, Ken Clark always says, uh, your fellow peer, that um, uh, he, he always felt that David Cameron, David Cameron was doing an impersonation <laughs> of Tony Blair, who himself was doing an impersonation of Bill Clinton, who himself was doing an impersonation of JFK. <laughs> <laughs> He may have had a point. <laughs> no. He may have had a point. I mean, I think you, know, you, you I mean, in politics, you do, you do look to uh, to those who've been before, and hopefully, you learn some lessons. I'm not going to do it that way. Or actually, this person, you know, uh, was was had a great approach, and I'm going to try and follow the way that they they, they did it. I'm not even going to risk doing an impersonation. I couldn't be as good as Gary in his Ken Clark. <laughs> right, but of course, well, the other thing he did was go to see Trump. Yeah, mm. in Mar-a-Lago. Um, so Wouldn't we that... love to have been a fly on the wall for that one? Yeah, exactly. I mean, was it wise? Yeah, it has to be. I mean, look, at the end of the day, um, we don't know what's going to happen in November, but clearly Trump is the Republican candidate now for, for, for president. Um, there is you know, every chance that he could be uh, president uh, again. And therefore, I think it, it, it would be... Uh, it would be wrong uh, not to try to, to, to reopen, I suppose, some relationship with, with Trump. It must have been, I'm going to assume, pretty uncomfortable. Is that why he would have gone, though? Or did he go for the immediate question of opening up Ukraine I suspect it was probably. I suspect it and was And to that. try and get Trump to tell yeah. his people... Well, it's a bit of both, isn't it, really? I mean, I guess it's, it's partly, um, you know, if you're, if you're there in the US, uh, why would you not seek out? And that, that is what happens. You meet other, other candidates. But, of course, there is the, the uh, immediate thing of uh, how can you reach out to senior Republicans. Trump is hugely influential, even though not currently in office, for other elected Republicans, including, presumably, Mike Johnson, uh, in terms of this issue about the Ukraine uh, support. Yeah, which suggests it didn't go very well, Gary. Well, we, yeah, um, the meeting with Mike Johnson didn't uh, happen. Take place, yes. And uh, nothing seems to be budging on uh, Donald Trump's approach to uh, these issues. The best sign we get in a private meeting like this this soon after the event, um, is the alternative accounts of what happened. David Cameron was saying at that meeting, we talked about geostrategic matters. If you look at the press release that the Trump campaign put out, uh, 
they said we talked about whether people were putting enough money into NATO and we talked about Brexit. Mm. Uh, and I'm sure both of them went in with different agendas, but the history of people going in uh, with the talking points that they want to discuss with Donald Trump is that you often end up on the ones yeah. he wanted to talk about. Let's end with our long or maybe medium range forecast. What global storms are likely to affect the election weather here? Gary, I mean, obviously the, the big one is the local elections coming up. Yes, and they're the two big contests that I think most eyes will be on in the Conservative Party are the West Midlands and Teesside. And talking to Conservatives, uh, they're looking at these because they worry that to lose both almost certainly triggers a vote of no confidence in Rishi Sunak, which he might survive, which he might not. He might decide uh, to walk. Who knows uh, what, what, what could happen in those circumstances. Uh, to lose one, to lose the West Midlands alone, may be absorbable, might just trigger a vote of no confidence, but lose both. And they think that's when there is a vote of no confidence. And the message of the past is that even prime ministers, Tory prime ministers who survive yeah. votes of no confidence, and there's a pretty much a strong expectation that he would win that vote, don't last long or wounded. And how can you really go to the electorate when a huge chunk of your, if a huge chunk of your parliamentary party has turned around and said, you're not the guy and are sort of marauding down the street behind you with uh, uh, political knives as you go to the electorate? Charlie, what's it, do, you, do you have a forecast? I think, uh, I think things are looking good for Labour. I think the public have completely switched off from the government, because the government is constantly making sort of big claims, the Rwanda stuff, the tax cutting stuff, the childcare stuff. There's not enough time for it to happen before an election. So why do we bother to listen? Every day that goes by, the government looks more and more illegitimate. I'm sure there will be a movement in the polls at some stage against us because people then have to make a choice rather than just thinking about how awful the government are. But at the moment, without being in any way complacent, it looks to me like we are going to win and we are going to win um, uh, with an overall majority. And I also think that nothing can now happen in the country till that is dealt with. We, the, the, the government has no authority because it's about to be removed. It's what people feel. Everybody is looking to what will happen after the government goes. For my own part, though I don't believe this will be translated into action, um, uh, we should be much better just going as quickly as possible because the public increasingly feel the sense of illegitimacy. I don't, I mean, you definitely remember, Gary, the build up to the 1997 election. <laughs> Uh, where yeah, you, remember uh, that yeah, one. you remember that one? You must have been about <laughs> forty at that point, or eighty. Uh, the, the 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 longer major hang on, the worse and worse it got. It, it gets from the a point is reached where if the government mm. is very very unpopular. Mm. You're right about uh, not much getting done, but we are about to start again in the Commons and the Lords, and this <laughs> is the last period of time really for any legislation to get through because, um, uh, you know, we are in the period, if you're going to have an autumn election, then frankly, it'll be washed up by September and not much happening. So this is the last few weeks. And then, of course, you know, who knows what's going to happen after local elections. Well, we'll leave it Our there. Our moment. <laughs> um, Baroness Morgan, <laughs> Lord Faulkner. <laughs> and, um, we can go by first names, Prince, it's fine. Prince Gary. Um, <laughs> thank you very much indeed all for joining us. That was The Political Forecast. Until next time, bye-bye.